We all know what a Disney princess looks like. Flowing hair, a charming smile, and above all, a pretty dress. Your lady awaits. <laughs> Disney's official princess lineup is pretty wide ranging, including characters like Merida, Pocahontas, and Mulan. But when you hear the phrase Disney princess, a certain image springs to mind a young woman in a frothy, pastel colored ball gown. But don't you think my dress. Yes, it's lovely, dear. Lovely. Good heavens, child! This brand is so strong that children's entertainers can make a living by wearing knockoff princess dresses to birthday parties. And if you dress as a princess for Halloween, you're probably not cosplaying as Catherine of Aragon or Nefertiti. You're wearing a costume inspired by Disney's classic image of a fairy tale heroine. This inescapable brand is evidence of Disney's stranglehold on pop culture. And it says a lot about what kind of stories and products are marketed toward little girls. It's also a brand that Disney created basically by accident, as I'll explain later on. Merryweather, make a tink. In many of Disney's classic fairy tale cartoons, a pivotal scene involves a young woman getting to wear a life-changingly beautiful dress. From a fashion perspective, these films have had a unique impact on generations of viewers. That makes Disney princesses an obvious choice for my first episode about animated costume design. Hi there, I'm Gavia Baker-Whitelaw and this is Behind the Seams, decoding the world of costume design. The first five Disney princess movies all come from European fairy tales. Snow White, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, The Little Mermaid, and Beauty and the Beast. Then in the 90s, Disney branched out with films like Mulan, Pocahontas, and Aladdin. For obvious reasons, their female leads wore noticeably different costumes from the European ball gowns worn by the original princesses. Like live action historical dramas, these cartoons take inspiration from real sources, but they also reflect the tastes of the period in which they were made. Released in 1937, Snow White takes place in an unspecified historical fantasy land. The original fairy tale was German, and the character's design could be from the 16th century, judging by her puffed sleeves and tight bodice. But her overall aesthetic reflects 1930s fashion, particularly her hair and makeup. Snow White's rosy cheeks were hand-drawn onto each individual cell of film, masterminded by an all-female team of artists led by animator Hazel Sewell. Unlike the male animators, they knew how makeup should be applied. While developing Snow White's initial design, a woman named Marge Champion modelled her costume for the artists. And in early concept art, Disney's Snow White also resembled the iconic 1930s cartoon character Betty Boop, who actually starred in a Snow White film of her own. I've heard about your looking glass, looking glass, looking glass. I've heard about your looking glass. What it says is so. The next two princess movies came out in the 1950s, which is where the Disney princess image really took hold. Cinderella appears to take place in 19th century Europe, although the costumes are very stylized. In the 2019 adaptation of Little Women, you'll see a more authentic image of a frothy, ultra-feminine party dress in 19th century America. And Victorian paintings show the direct inspiration for the dresses we see in Cinderella. However, Cinderella's clothes, shoes and makeup are also clearly rooted in 1950s fashion. She embodies the wide-eyed charm of Doris Day. With a story that hinges on a maidservant transforming into a beautiful princess, this movie cemented Hollywood's image of fairy tale femininity. Cinderella's dress actually has a more important narrative role than the prince. The main conflict is all about her wanting to go to the ball, but having her dress torn away by her evil stepsisters. Then the fairy godmother rescues her by delivering an even better gown. When Cinderella falls in love, the prince is like a reward for her innate gracefulness and beauty, contrasting with her rude and unattractive stepsisters. Thanks to the impact of classic Disney cartoons like this, the archetypal princess dress 
combines elements of 18th and 19th century ball gowns with 1950s evening wear. It's all about looking pretty without being too sexy, and for 70 years, other fairy tale movies have followed the same basic formula. Oh, do it again! Show me! Oh, that's wonderful! Show me again! A few years after Cinderella, Disney's Sleeping Beauty combined a stylized medieval outfit with the narrow-waisted silhouette and flowing skirt of a 1950s party dress. These 1950s heroines reflect the elegance of Grace Kelly, Hollywood's real-life princess. Actress Helene Stanley modelled for both Cinderella and Princess Aurora. When you see her in action, you really notice the crossover between those classic Disney cartoons and the cheerful aesthetic of 1950s musicals. Then came Disney's revival in the 90s, kickstarted by The Little Mermaid in 1989. Ariel wears vaguely 18th or 19th century clothes, while Beauty and the Beast was more explicitly rooted in 18th century France, with Belle wearing a detailed Rococo-style ball gown. Watching clips from the ballroom scenes in these films, you totally understand why they captured the hearts of so many children. The dresses worn by Belle and Cinderella are flouncier, sparklier, and more gravity-defying than anything you could make in real life. That includes Emma Watson's dress in the live-action Beauty and the Beast, which looked limp and flat compared to the cartoon. In later movies, we also see Rapunzel and Tiana wear their own versions of the archetypal Disney princess dress. Tiana is an interesting one because The Princess and the Frog takes place in a very specific setting. 1920s New Orleans, and Tiana gets to wear two beautiful dresses, a blue party dress and a traditional princess ball gown at the end of the movie. Neither of them bear much resemblance to 1920s fashion, and Tiana's costumes have more in common with 1950s silhouettes. In reality, 1920s dresses look almost rectangular, aiming for the polar opposite of an hourglass figure. Evening gowns didn't have narrow waists, but they were sometimes very low cut. This wouldn't fit with Disney's recurring image of a 1950s fairy tale. Disney's recent princesses come from more racially diverse backgrounds and are much more proactive in their own stories. It's time to put my stone on the mountain. Okay. While the early princesses were very passive, characters like Moana and Mulan have distinctive personalities. They're no longer valued purely for their beauty and warm-hearted nature, reflecting the way gender norms evolved in real life. These days, there's more public demand for the heroines of children's movies to be funny, empowered, and individualistic. But in the same way that superhero comics keep returning to the ideas laid out by Batman and Superman in the 1940s, Disney keeps returning to the same aesthetic for princesses. This raises the question of what actually defines a Disney princess. It's hard to believe now, but from a branding perspective, Disney princesses didn't exist as a concept until the 21st century. In the year 2000, former Nike executive Andy Mooney took charge of Disney's consumer products division. While attending a Disney on Ice event, he noticed dozens of little girls dressed as princesses, but not in official Disney costumes. He immediately realized there was a demand for fairy tale princess merchandise, something that any parent of a little girl could probably tell you already. This kickstarted the idea of Disney princesses as a cohesive brand, marketing a group of characters together with new merchandise and spin off materials. It was an instant success. Come on, it's time. These days, the official princess lineup is as follows. Snow White, Cinderella, Aurora, Ariel, Belle, Jasmine, Pocahontas, Mulan, Tiana, Rapunzel, Merida, and Moana. These characters are all descended from royal families or fall in love with princes. You may notice that Anna and Elsa from Frozen aren't on this list. That's because they're queens, not princesses. But if you asked a random person on the street, they'd probably say the girls from Frozen do count, while some of the official lineup are more ambiguous. I am Moana of Motunu. Technically speaking, Moana fulfills all the Disney princess criteria. She's the daughter of a chief, she stars in an animated musical, and she has an animal sidekick. But without a European-style ball gown, she doesn't fit our image of the Disney princess trope. Rooted in Polynesian folklore, Moana's film is a fantasy adventure story. 
her costume is practical and realistic, inspired by traditional Polynesian clothing and textiles. For the studio's marketing purposes, she's definitely a Disney princess. But based on our cultural assumptions about princesses as a cinematic trope, she doesn't fit the bill. In other words, the Disney princess brand is so strong that it clashes with Disney's own desire for racial inclusivity. This whole situation began with Disney making fairy tale cartoons in the mid 20th century. Those cartoons reflected conservative values and beauty standards, tacitly aimed at white audiences. Just four years before Cinderella, Disney had released the notoriously racist musical Song of the South. When Mulan and Pocahontas arrived in the 90s, those filmmakers had radically different goals. They arguably operated in a different genre. But once Disney realized princesses were marketable, the studio decided to lump all these characters together, creating a racially and thematically diverse lineup. This brand is so important that when a movie like Moana comes along, it now has to follow certain guidelines so the character counts as a Disney princess. We have the same title yet are never described the same way. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Who are all you? This reflects the internal struggle of Disney's entire business strategy. From children's cartoons to the new wave of Star Wars and Marvel spin-offs, Disney thrives on nostalgia. The studio wants to attract its audience at a young age. Failing that, it acquires franchises that already have a foothold in people's childhood memories. The older the brand, the more power it has. That's why most new Disney projects are spin-offs or remakes, attempting to monetize nostalgia while adding a dash of modernity. But many of these old franchises are pretty conservative, either conceptually or in terms of casting. That includes the enduring legacy of passive, feminine princesses who look pretty, do housework, and achieve a happy ending by getting married. So these days, you'll notice a divide between how Disney markets the old and new princesses. Vintage characters like Sleeping Beauty are all about the image of a princess, primarily the costumes. They're massively popular at Disney World and in merchandise. But Disney downplays the original story behind these characters. Cinderella is not an aspirational heroine for modern girls. Meanwhile, Merida and Moana are cool, relatable heroes with educational and empowering storylines. They're marketed in a totally different way. And while their costumes are arguably more thoughtful, they aren't as lucrative as a classic trope with decades of nostalgia and brand recognition behind it. It's no coincidence that Frozen was such a smash hit. While Anna and Elsa aren't literally princesses, they're very obviously a modern version of the European fairy tale heroines we saw in the 1950s. Their costumes combine a vaguely 19th century silhouette with traditional Norwegian clothing, making them visibly different from Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty without straying too far from popular themes. This enduring obsession with princess costumes also explains Tiana's pale green ball gown. It only appears on screen for about 30 seconds, but it's still her signature look. Its entire purpose is to fulfill the demand for a traditional princess dress. In some ways, the classic Disney princess brand has evolved a lot. Look up there! Oh, it's a big, strong man in need of rescuing! <laughs> Once Disney realized that these characters could be marketed as a group, the studio started fleshing out their stories in spin-offs. In new films and cartoons, the original princesses become funnier and more proactive, catering to modern sensibilities. But for merchandising purposes, they usually retain their original costumes. The Disney princess dress is now almost as recognizable as a wedding gown, outstripping any other costume trope in Western cinema. Everyone knows what it is. With branding that strong, no wonder Disney is milking these characters for all they're worth. They're all looking at you. Believe me, they're all looking at you. Thanks for watching Behind the Seams. As a kid, Mulan and Pocahontas were the Disney films that really captured my imagination, mostly because I was the right age when they came out. What were your favourites growing up? Share your Disney princess opinions in the comments section below. I read every single one and respond to most. And if you're new to the channel, please be sure to like this video and subscribe, it really helps us grow. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.